We might be a small island, but we've got a big history that's still full of mysteries. So every year, hundreds of archaeologists go out hunting for clues to our forgotten past. I have never seen anything like that. In 2016, their discoveries have been more exciting than ever. It's all happening now. You little devil, Johan! Yeah. <laughs> In this episode, Digging for Britain showcases the very best of them from the West. Each excavation was filmed as it happened by the archaeologists themselves. Their dig diaries mean that we can be there for every exciting moment of discovery. Crushing little finds. Superb. <laughs> and now the archaeologists are bringing their finds from pottery to metalwork to human remains into our lab so that we can get a closer look at them and find out what they tell us about our British ancestors. Welcome to Digging for Britain. In this episode, we're joining archaeologists in the West as they make discoveries that will transform the history of Britain. On Jersey, a 2,000-year-old hoard of hidden treasure... It's heavy. <laughs> reveals the terror of the Roman invasion. <laughs> oh, that is stunningly beautiful. Yep. In Tintagel, Cornwall, an incredible Dark Age palace is uncovered at the mythical home of King Arthur. See, I'm starting to go on flights of fancy now, and to me, yep. this is where King Arthur lived. And on Salisbury Plain, a lost map unearths hidden trenches that revolutionise our view of the First World War. This is as if the British have captured the German trenches and then they have to dig in facing German counter-attack from up the hill. To put these revelations in context, I've come to Bristol Museum. And I've been given privileged behind-the-scenes access to see some of the archaeological treasures rarely seen by the public. But our first dig diary takes us 40 miles away to Stonehenge. Three thousand years ago, our ancestors built Stonehenge as a site of ceremony and ritual west of the River Avon. In recent years, archaeologists have come to believe that Stonehenge is just part of a vast sacred landscape full of monuments. But so far, their discoveries have mainly been to the west of the Avon. What lies to the east has largely been a mystery, until this year, when a team from Wessex Archaeology started digging at Bulford. At Bulford, just three miles away from Stonehenge, the discoveries were not only unexpected, they were unique. And they're helping to write a whole new chapter in the history of this archaeologically rich landscape. Shiv this out a bit. Phil Harding leads the team. Hi, this is Phil Harding. I'm talking to you on the edge of Salisbury Plain, about three miles east of Stonehenge. That's in that direction there. And I'm working on a site here. We've been working here since, what, just before Christmas now. And this is really quite an exciting site. Come and have a look. The team has uncovered something never seen in Britain before. A double henge, two circular banks and ditches. So what we found are two previously unknown henge monuments. This is an incredible opportunity to unravel part of the ritual landscape of this part of Wiltshire, most importantly, just down the road from Stonehenge. So what Phil really wants to find out is whether this site was in use at the same time as Stonehenge and exactly what our Neolithic ancestors were doing here. Ground-penetrating radar reveals a series of pits 
just outside the double henge. That is amazing. Phil hopes that these will provide the evidence he needs. <laughs> An axe. Excellent. It's a promising find. That is absolutely gorgeous. With a blade there, just beautifully polished. Neolithic axes were incredibly important tools used for the clearing of trees during the earliest days of farming. Putting one in a pit seems like a huge sacrifice. There would be plenty of use left in this. And to place one of these in a pit, throw away a genuinely useful axe. Why would you do it? As well as dozens of axe heads, mysterious chalk balls are found in the pits. Ah, lovely. Oh, what a gem. These are finds that connect us to our ancestors and fulfil its precious evidence of what they were doing here. I'm sure they must have been maybe lucky mementos, maybe superstitious, maybe totemic items, some sort of votive offering to the gods, and maybe it brought them good luck. In one week, 40 pits are excavated, and what's found in each one is remarkably similar. This is an incredible collection of material. It's as though people have got a checklist and they're placing objects into the pit. These are such enigmatic clues, glimpses of the rituals being carried out at the Double Henge. <laughs> Didn't want to come. But some of the pits contain something rather different. Now, that is what I call a bone. <laughs> it's from an aurochs. God, look at the size of it. A giant prehistoric cow. The aurochs was not on the average Friday night takeaway menu. I think what we are really looking at is festive, feasting, celebrations. Who knows, it might be seasonal, it might be marriage, it could be any other things. But what it is not is your day-to-day -day rubbish. This seems then to be a ritual site where our ancestors held religious feasts. But can Phil be sure that it's contemporary with Stonehenge? Can we prove that these ring ditches is of the same date as our Neolithic pits? If we can do that, then we actually find an incredible ritual complex of the same date as maybe Stonehenge. The team digs a trench across the double henge, looking for evidence that will give them a date. Phil, look at that. What you got there, then? Pot? Yeah, but with decoration. Ah! That is? Yeah. I swear that is. That's decorated. You little devil, Johan. It's a fragment of pottery. Well, I'm getting really, really excited about this because it looks like it is decorated. You can see there's a bit of a ridge there and a bit of a ridge there, and these grooves. And I think that that is the best indicator that we've got of grooved ware, which is the typical late Neolithic pottery. That is what we want to find. Grooved ware pottery like this dates from the same period as Stonehenge, so it strongly suggests that this double henge was in use at the same time. I've invited Phil to come into our lab with some of his finds to give me a fuller picture as to what our ancestors were really up to at this unique site. They are places where people are gathering together and feasting, and they have to be ceremonial monuments. So these very strange balls, I mean, what are those about? These are made out of chalk. What you'll notice in some places, you look, look at that, you can see the, the actual manufacturing traces. Now, chalk is a very soft rock. If you start beating it about too much, you will wear those manufacturing traces away. So I think that they are ritual material, being made for some function, and then they are then being placed in the pit. Those spheres, those balls are special. 
<laughs> now, what about the stone tools then? So these were these were coming out of the pit oh, as well. Axes, axes were incredibly powerful objects to them. They're almost symbolic offerings to show their wealth, their status, their power, because the material that is in the pits is the refuse, if you like, from people who are carrying out the ceremonies in our henge-type monuments. This completely unexpected discovery reveals a significant ritual site where Neolithic people gathered for ceremonies and feasting. By the time you've done all your post-excavation work on this, what are you going to add to our understanding of the Stonehenge landscape? The people at my site would probably have witnessed the construction of Stonehenge. They're just a few miles away. And what we've now done is we're moving our knowledge from the West Bank of the River Avon and showing that equally as important mm. is, is life on the East Bank. And it just blows me over. I mean, I'm just absolutely... <laughs> <laughs> Britain's first double henge is a massive discovery that over the next few years could fundamentally change our understanding of how our ancestors 4,500 years ago used the Stonehenge landscape. Our next excavation also takes place on Salisbury Plain, just five miles away from Stonehenge. But the story it's revealing is very different and took place just a hundred years ago. 2016 was the hundredth anniversary of the Battle of the Somme, the bloodiest battle in the history of the British Army, with 60,000 casualties on the first day alone. Those that led the campaign have been widely criticised for the way the battle was fought, for the inexperience and inadequate training of the soldiers. But does archaeology support that perception that the young men of Britain were sent to the Western Front like lambs to the slaughter. Salisbury Plain. Covering an area the size of the Isle of Wight, for over a hundred years it's been the site of Britain's largest military training ground. During World War I, thousands of soldiers came here in preparation for fighting in the trenches of northern France. However, it's often thought that this training was too short and inadequate. Incredibly, a map has been uncovered in the National Archive that might change this perception once and for all. It suggests that the army was at least planning to recreate German trenches of the Western Front in these fields, so our soldiers could rehearse attacks on them. But were those trenches ever actually dug and used for training? Okay. Yeah. Military archaeologist Richard Osgood has come to investigate to get a map of where they've sited these practice trenches is really unusual. You've got individual notifications on the map, so an S is a shelter. Um, MG, you might have guessed, is a machine gun position. To get all that together is really, really a, a huge opportunity. But nonetheless, the map tells you about what they're meant to do. It doesn't tell you what, it, what actually does happen. Maybe this map was schematic, maybe it's not what's dug. Our job here over the next couple of weeks is really to see what's left under the ground. And the ideal would be to get architecture from trenches and evidence for the lives of the people that were here a hundred years ago. Trench warfare dominated World War I. With the invention of new powerful weapons such as massed artillery bombardments and rapid firing machine guns, soldiers were forced to dig trenches to hide in for protection. Soldiers could live in these trenches for weeks at a time before being ordered to go over the top and charge at the enemy. 
If Richard can prove that extensive German trench fortifications were recreated on Salisbury Plain, it's proof that the soldiers sent here received comprehensive training in attacking German positions, dispelling the notion that they were ill-prepared. On the first day of the dig, Richard's team starts to look for evidence of one of the German frontline trenches marked on the map. We're looking for a machine gun position. It's marked, helpfully, MG on the map. Already we're finding lots and lots of traces of the architecture of the trench, and this is just stripping the topsoil off. Richard finds a post from which barbed wire would have been hung, cleverly designed so it could be put into the ground without making a noise. If you're putting a barbed wire fence in into no man's land, you're hitting it with a hammer, it's making a big noise, and snipers soon um, are attracted to that. The way they work out how to deal with that is to put these things in, and it's got a, this will have a, a sort of a corkscrew at the bottom, and to put it into the ground, you put a stick through this eyelet, and then you wind it down into the ground. And a few metres away, they find the barbed wire that it would have supported. You know, you look at the obstacle of that. Imagine having that in front of the, uh, the feature you're trying to take. It's a real impediment. Then, just behind where the barbed wire was found, they discover what they've been looking for, a section of a front-line German trench. So we're on the German front-line trenches, and we were hoping to find the firing positions. Do you think we've got any evidence for that, Rich? We've got some really good evidence. We've got what we have identified now as a fire step. So a fire step is what lets you stand up out of the trench. So when it when you need to fire, you can get up, you can fire over the top. And then when you finish, you can get down into the relative safety of that extra foot and a half um, worth of soil. This is clear evidence that the soldiers were training to capture authentically recreated frontline German trenches. But were the fortifications marked on the map behind the front line also built. If they were, it would prove that the soldiers were training not only to attack the front line, but also to fight right through to the rear. OK, so we've got this really interesting shelter. And importantly, we've got the corrugated iron roof that covered the shelter. We've got this little step here which is probably some sort of seating arrangement so that with the roof above, people could sit underneath. Shelters like these would have offered some protection from the elements, as well as from the shrapnel of artillery bombardments. Even more interesting is at the very bottom, we've got all this trample, which actually shows where the troops would have been walking during the time of using these trenches. The trample floor isn't the only evidence that these trenches weren't just for show, but were used by large numbers of soldiers. What we're looking at, is it a latrine or not? It is a latrine. Um, uh, for you, it's more of a urinal rather than a, a proper toilet. We know that because of the uh, yellow, sandy-like material at the bottom. <laughs> That's put very politely. Richard is now excavating trenches even further back from the front line, and here he finds evidence of how soldiers were trained to continue the battle once the German trenches had been captured. There's a shelf facing up the hill in each of these little slots. This is as if the, the British have captured the German trenches and they've worked their way through the German front line, they've got through the, re, the reserve and support lines, and then they have to dig in facing the presumed German counter-attack from up the hill. It's evidence that major battle simulations were taking place here. After two weeks, they've uncovered an extensive network of trenches, shelters and machine gun positions a faithful recreation of what soldiers could expect to encounter on battlefields like the Somme. They utilise the high ground over there, they utilise the high ground in front of me um, and the hillside behind me. And this is just the German positions. This is hectares and hectares. It's a, it's a vast training landscape. It's incredible that this map had been lost and without it, we wouldn't have had a clue that so much effort had been made in recreating such an amazingly huge trench system. Richard's discovery on the ground changes World War I history 
and the view that soldiers were poorly trained before being sent to war. People that are training through this in 1915 are getting as good an experience as they possibly can. This is the example of, of generals really trying their very best to give the training required for what's going to happen in 1916. Getting away from the idea of these chaps just walking around the parade square with broom handles and then being sent to imminent death on the Battle of the Somme. Even practicing on Salisbury Plain, trench warfare must have been miserable. So what can archaeology tell us about the men who trained here? Richard has come into the lab to tell me. And you've got some of the artefacts here Yeah, as well. we do. This is all about morale in many ways. You can be bored in the trenches and uh, wet and miserable. And the one thing you want to do if you're, you're sitting there cold and tired is have a brew. And that tin over there, that's a tin of condensed milk. Right. And the soldiers bayoneted it. Yeah. You can imagine them sitting there in the trench, need a brew, and you pour that, the condensed milk in, and chuck the tin away. And that's, yeah. I think that's lovely. That's, that's all about keeping sane, frankly. Um, the other thing you've got connected with that sort of thing is, is that thing. Um, I'm really pleased this was empty and we didn't damage it in opening it because that's a, a, a tin of sardines. You can imagine what that would have been like 100 years on yeah. if we'd opened it. Yeah. But again, having things like tins of fish, cups of tea, will make these practice trenches not seem quite so bad as they might otherwise. They're not under fire from the Germans here, but nonetheless, they've got the same sort of misery of, of existence. Um, and that's the sort of thing that's critical to get into the training. And what's this? This has got some writing on it. It's you can see Liverpool... Mm. Reg on it. It's yeah. part of the King's Liverpool Regiment. You think of the famous Kitchener poster in 1914, the big recruitment. Yeah. One. It's these guys, recruited in 1914, but we had no idea that they were pretty certainly here, training for what became the Battle of the Somme, and they've left that carving behind. So they've just carved that in a, in a lump of chalk. Board yeah. soldier carving their, their uh, regiment into this thing, and it ends up in the bottom of the trench. But a fantastic record they were there. Oh, it's lovely. Uh, we didn't know they were there. That's why archaeology is brilliant, because that links you to the people, and that's what's so crucial, that you get back to those individual stories of those guys that were here in the First War. After that training experience, they then go through into the, the, this very famous first day of the Battle of the Somme, mm. and for them, it goes pretty well. Um, they take really? relatively... Yeah, it's, because it's there are thousands and thousands of casualties. Famous figure of 60,000 casualties on yeah, the first day. Yeah. But for the Liverpool Pals, they fight alongside the French on the right-hand side of the British attack, and they take all their objectives, and they take relatively few casualties. And that's not the story you get when you think of the Battle of the Somme. Despite the extensive training that Richard has shown these soldiers received, training wasn't enough. Just a few weeks after their success on the first day of the Somme, the 4,000 eager young volunteers of the Liverpool Pals had received over a 1,000 casualties. A shocking one in four. This is one of Bristol Museum's greatest treasures, the Thornbury Hoard. It consists of 11,460 coins, and it was buried in the 4th century AD, just as the Roman army was withdrawing from Britain. But actually, this pales into insignificance beside a recently discovered hoard, one of the largest ever found, this time dating to the 1st century BC, when Britain was on the cusp of being assimilated into the Roman Empire. The island of Jersey. In 2012, two metal detectorists found a massive hoard of 2,000-year-old coins in a potato field. Jersey heritage painstakingly excavated. It was the world's biggest discovery of Iron Age coins ever. The archaeologists wanted to find out what treasures lay inside and what it tells us about the British Isles at a time when the Romans were advancing towards our shores. The hoard was taken to the local museum where conservator Neil Mara and his team began the painstaking task of clearing off the mud. There were an extraordinary 70,000 coins. and more treasure 
lay hidden within. Unusual coloured beads. Rather lovely. And gold and silver bracelets. This has been much more complicated than expected. We're lifting one piece at a time out, but everything is interlinked and fitted around each other. Ha-ha, success. It's a piece of silver wire, probably from jewellery, just cut up and essentially just scrap metal on that. Who would have cut up this precious metal? And why was it all hidden? As they dig deeper into the hoard looking for clues, they uncover its greatest treasure. It's heavy. It's heavy. It's heavy. It's heavy. An amazing collection of thick golden torques, ornate neck rings. Only the most important people in Iron Age society would have worn neck rings of this thickness and weight. After 2,000 years in the ground, it's taken Neil four years carefully picking it apart to reveal its contents. We've now removed 50,000 coins, so we're, uh, we think, five-sevenths of the way in. Um, about 20,000 coins left, and you can see there's still a few things outstanding. With so much of the hoard now revealed, Neil has made some startling revelations. Well, it's the biggest coin hoard of its kind in the world. We know which tribe actually made it because uh, the coins that have already come off and we've cleaned are of a type we've seen before from the Coriosolite tribe with a head on one side and a very, very abstract horse on the other. The Coriosolite were an Iron Age tribe of Celts that inhabited part of what is now Brittany in France. So why did they bury this vast treasure on Jersey? Neil has come into the lab with some of this amazing treasure to tell me. Neil, let's be clear about this. This is an absolutely enormous hoard, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's got the stage now where in this hoard we've got more coins of this period than have been found in, in France at all. In the whole of France? Yeah. And as we've gone through, we found more and more apart from the coins. Talks with a big surprise for us. I mean, this is one of eight complete ones that we have. Can I pick that up? Yeah, please do. So this is a, a gold Iron Age neck ring. Yeah. How I do mean, you get it onto your neck? Um, they come in two halves, so you'd literally give it like a twist like that and then pull apart. And the pattern is peculiar because it's it, it's not facing the observer. No, it's, it's actually kind of facing the, the wearer. It would be inside by your throat. Yes. Yeah, that's beautiful. What about the coins themselves? Do they give us a clue as to the date? I mean, literally 99.5% of the coins in this hoard date to around sort of 62 BC or before. They're Dated. lovely. Look at that. So They're beautiful faces, aren't they? Wonderful little face on that side. We yeah. know that those were all made in the run-up to the invasion by Julius Caesar. And so perhaps they knew that Julius Caesar was coming up from the south, defeating, you know, tribe after tribe after tribe, mm. and that they hid their wealth. They actually got it offshore, rode the thing to Jersey. Mm. Now, we seem to be somewhere that was quite hard to reach, quite hard to land, and so perhaps it was somewhere to hide. And dug yeah. it, buried it, with the idea, presumably, of coming back for it later, and were perhaps killed. The burial of the Jersey Horde reveals the fear that gripped the Celtic tribes as the Romans advanced towards our shores. But conversely, the Thornbury Horde at Bristol Museum dates from a time when, 300 years later, the Romans were in retreat, showing us that the collapse of empire could be equally tumultuous. The Thornbury Hoard that's on display upstairs is just a small portion of the 11,460 Roman coins that were discovered. And so I've come down here to the stores to look more closely at some of those coins and find out more about the hoard. How was it discovered? It was discovered by a man who was digging a fish pond in his back garden, so he found the remains of a pot with over 11,500 coins inside all of a similar type, all of a similar period. 
these coins act as a history of the Roman Empire. Virtually all the coins are Constantinian, so Constantine, the yeah. emperor that's associated with enabling Christianity to be worshipped across the empire. And found in Constantinople. And found in Constantinople. So you get two types of coins. So you get one coin in this hoard, which hark back to the foundation of Rome. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. So we've got a little wolf with Romulus and Remus underneath. That's a gorgeous coin. Look at that. And then there's a female personification of the new empire's capital, which is Constantinople, mm. and that is Constantinopolis. The coins are also evidence of the empire's decline. By this time, the coinage has become very debased, there's very little silver content, and virtually everything is made out of copper alloy, and also not quite as well modelled. So the coins are, are being literally debased, they are getting smaller. Is this a sign of a crumbling economy then as Rome goes into decline? Yes, the, the debasing everything. So where are these minted then? Are they, are they British coins in origin? None of the ones that I've seen are actually from Britain. We know that because they have little marks on the bottoms of them. We've done a sort of, it's almost like an airline map of where these things have come from. And the furthest one that we've found is Antioch. And Turkey and we've got things from Thessalonica, but also Croatia. As part of the empire, Roman Britain was connected with diverse people and cultures across Europe and beyond. And this was also a period of relative peace. But when the empire crumbled, it must have been a difficult and even frightening experience for many people. And why on earth was this volume of coins buried? That's the $64,000 question, because we have no idea. This was a troubled time, wasn't it? So, uh, I mean, I suppose there are numerous different reasons that somebody could be burying money in the ground. They, um, could. they could. They could be trying to hide it. Um, it could be effectively banking it. And you kept it and you hid it from anybody. You didn't want to have it. And that might be somebody you thought was, was coming to raid. And clearly, we have no idea why nobody collected it. By the 4th century AD, the Romans were pulling out of Britain, and whoever buried these coins never came back for them. Britain was plunged into a period of uncertainty for the next 600 years, sometimes known as the Dark Ages. Our next excavation provides brand new and very strange clues as to how our ancestors made sense of this upheaval. For archaeologists, burial sites can offer precious clues as to how our ancestors lived and died. But sometimes they also provide us with surprising insights into what seem to us today to be bizarre beliefs and strange rituals long since forgotten. Deep in the Wye Valley in Hereford, a team of archaeologists is on their way to investigate an intriguing discovery near a remote cave. Day one, the site is up a very, very steep slope, which is densely wooded. On three sides of the site, there are 60-foot high vertical cliffs. And immediately above the site, there is the opening of a small cave. Known locally as Merlin's Cave, in the 1920s, an incredible find of prehistoric tools, pottery and bones was made, revealing this to be a sacred burial site for our Neolithic ancestors over 4,500 years ago. But in 2011, a new discovery was made, purely by chance, just below the entrance. I was doing caving with one of my sons and uh, we decided to try and get into this cave which is about 15 foot up the cliff face. So um, I left my son sat on what was a tree throw. And while I was scaling the, the cliff here, he discovered flint scraper, a really lovely flint scraper, and some pieces of pottery and some teeth. Clyde took the finds to the county archaeologist. The pottery was prehistoric, the teeth were human, Mm. and the flint was early Neolithic. 
The county archaeologist Tim Hayward was so intrigued by the finds that he organised a dig to see if he could find whether there was a connection between these new finds and the ones in the cave. What he found was even more exciting. We found two human skeletons are laid out under two of the tree throws. We carbon dated them to about 600 AD. This was shocking. Tim had expected to find Neolithic skeletons, but these were Dark Age skeletons from the 7th century AD, and they were lying outside a prehistoric burial site. But with such a huge time difference, surely there couldn't be a connection. Then the next piece of evidence emerged. One of the burials had bones deposited with it, dated to the Bronze Age from the cave, so 12, 13, 1400 years older than the, the burial. The prehistoric human bones seem to have been deliberately placed in the later graves. Whoever buried these men clearly knew about the earlier burials inside the cave. So what we wanted to know was who these people were and why they were involved with the burial in the cave we know that they were doing something very strange, very different. Are these two men the only ones buried here, or are they part of something much bigger? This year, another dig was organised to find out. It's a very unusual place to find people being buried. We're on a very steep hillside. The soil isn't very deep. It's actually quite hard to make a grave that's deep enough to bury a body. Now, the reason we've come back here to do further investigations is to try and determine the extent of this burial activity. Do we only have two burials, or is it actually a small cemetery? A trench is dug a short distance from where the two burials were found. After two days of digging, they start to get results. We've just found a human bone which is projecting out of the side of the section of the trench. It's a fragment of a large human femur and we're further to the south of where the previous two burials are and it's giving us an idea that the extent of this burial area is considerably larger than we'd seen previously. more human remains are uncovered. We've just found this, which is a human tooth. It's actually a human canine, an adult tooth. And then a, a little bit of bone, uh, which is just from the, the path. Now we're finding remains of other skeletons, including the thigh bone of a newborn child. Now, up to now, all of the bones found from these burials have been of adults. But now we're finding evidence that even very young infants are being buried at this site. Analysis shows that these date from the same period as the skeletons first found beneath the cave entrance. It's evidence that the team has uncovered the burial ground of a Dark Age community. It's an incredibly strange discovery. Prehistoric burials inside the cave seem to have been so important to this community 2,000 years later that they chose to be buried close to the cave. Even though digging graves on this steep ground must have been incredibly difficult. And another discovery is made, evidence that these people are also being buried, along with bones from inside the cave. Now, on the top of this bone here, we can see encrustation, and it, this is in fact tufa or stalagmite, which is only formed inside the caves. This bone has come out of a cave, so this provides a direct link between the cave up there and what's being deposited down here. The team from Manchester University have discovered not only a forgotten burial ground, but a strange funerary ritual that's been lost for 1,400 years. I'm interested to find out what the archaeologists think was going on here.
So you've got Dark Age burials outside the cave, and then inside the cave there seems to have been a lot of bone, human and animal bone, from much, much earlier, some period from in prehistory. From the Neolithic. Um, it's buried with two uh, cow bones. So this bit here? Yep. Yeah. So a bit of cow rib. One. And then there's the knuckle of a cow leg bone by his head that he was buried with as well. Tim believes there could be a special connection between this particular man and the earlier burials inside the cave. And have you analysed the, the bones? What are you able to say about this individual? He is certainly well into his 50s, if not in his early 60s when he died. He was a, a very tall person, or at least he was well over six feet. We can see that with yes. him lying out I here, mean, can't we? I mean, look, at those, look at those thigh huge. bones. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that he is large and robust and lived to a, a reasonable age would suggest that, if nothing else, he was well fed, which may suggest that he was being looked after. So who do you think he was? I think just with the fact that he's buried with um, animal bones that must have come from the cave, that he was actually in charge of looking after the contents of the cave for a period of time. So you're seeing this as a, as a sort of cult centre, then? I think a cult is probably the way to look at it. They're honouring uh, their ancestors and they're honouring a cave that, as far as they're concerned, has been there for millennia. But at the same time, both burials seem to be laid out in, broadly speaking, a Christian tradition. Um, extended with arms folded over the pelvis. So in that sense, they've, they're following the Christian tradition, but there is this little bit of prehistoric bone as perhaps an indication that, OK, we're, we're going to do this Christian style, but we'll include something from the past to show that we haven't forgotten about that tradition. The Dark Ages were a tumultuous period in British history. Anglo-Saxon tribes were invading and it was a time of great political and religious change, with the establishment of new kingdoms and pagan ideas vying with Christianity for supremacy. It's highly likely that these weren't Anglo-Saxons. These were actually the native Welsh um, Britons, if you like, and they're adapting to Christianity as it comes from the south and east and moving up into the west, and they're gradually adapting. Such a strange sight, and I think it really reminds us we don't expect everybody across England and Wales to be doing exactly the same thing at the same time. The community at Merlin's Cave reached back into their past, combining burial practice with what seems to be an ancestor cult, and perhaps that provided them with much needed reassurance during such an uncertain period in our history. After the Romans left, Dark Age Britain is often thought of as less civilised and more backward, a time when we lost cultural and trading connections, not only with Rome, but with the world at large. But now a striking new discovery in Tintagel, Cornwall, is challenging this view. Tintagel is best known for its connections with the legendary King Arthur, who, according to myth, was conceived there. Well, this year, archaeologists returned to Tintagel, hoping to investigate its rich Dark Age history and disentangle archaeological fact from Arthurian fiction. Castle remains that you can see on Tintagel today date from the medieval period, but archaeological remains from around 600 AD found on previous excavations suggest that there was once a large Dark Age settlement here. In 2016, archaeologists returned to Tintagel to explore areas of the island that had never been dug before. They wanted to find out what kind of settlement it was, but what they found took them all by surprise. day one of the Dig Diary. And today we've started excavating on the eastern terrace just here and over behind the castle on the southern terrace. We've opened up four trenches and that's where we're hoping to find what we used to call Dark Age buildings or buildings that belong to the 5th and 6th century. 
the archaeologists from English Heritage and Cornwall Archaeological Unit have barely begun to strip off the turf when they make their first discovery. We've got this possible floor layer of paving. Evidence for the construction of terraces. What it looks like is that we have three distinct flat terraces with slopes between at the moment, which we hope when we take some material away, we'll find some nice walls. Disappointingly, further digging reveals no traces of buildings. Maybe there are some terraces which are being used for small, in, small enclosures, maybe as cultivation plots rather than for buildings. But who were these cultivation plots for? On the south side of the island, they make an extraordinary discovery. We have three terraces. Um, this being the substantial wall at the southern end and leading to another wall, presumably for a building, and that leads nicely to a set of steps. And they lead neatly to part of the top building. So we think this is the building. Nice level floor and steps up to it. This is their first big breakthrough. Massive one metre thick rock walls are revealed. Never before has such a solid Dark Age building been discovered in Britain. Substantial build to top and top end. But what is this building? In their search for clues, they find a rubbish pit next to it. We've got an animal jawbone here, so you can see the teeth. Something like a wild boar, perhaps. The remains of boar and other animals may be evidence of a Dark Age feast. I can see. <laughs> and further surprising finds suggest this was a high-status building. Yeah. Oh, right. Is it? Oh. So a shallow ball, nice rim. Oh. Put a bit of fruit in or something. Oh, it's beautiful. It it's, uh, looks like the seeing, uh, which is from uh, Turkey. So that is yeah, a beautiful right. thing. And Carl Thorpe, the small finds expert, is particularly excited by the discovery of an incredibly oh, well. rare piece of glass. I you like it. <laughs> oh, that is stunningly beautiful. Yeah. That is definitely post-Roman glass. Uh -huh. uh, it's, it's even a rim, which is fantastic. And judging from the curvature, I think it was of a little cone cup between the 5th and sort of 7th centuries AD. So a Merovingian glass uh, originated in France. In France somewhere, yeah. For what? For most likely drinking yeah. wine. And that is just it is always stunningly beautiful. The team were simply not expecting to find this many high-quality foreign goods. The people living here were clearly not only very wealthy, but trading over vast distances. We've got a small shirt of what what looks to be amphora. That's from the Aegean area, Eastern Mediterranean. Wow, so, fantastic. Yeah. By day 12, the team has unearthed the foundations of a building 11 metres long and four metres wide. They're convinced that the people who lived here must have had immense wealth and power. I don't think that anything like this has been found before. So there was some surprised faces. Uh, and lo and behold, it's gone on and on. So this might be the style for the whole precinct of buildings on the southern side. Um, substantial walls will hold up substantial roofs. So, yeah, it's all good. Very exciting. Further excavations throughout the rest of the summer revealed that this was just part of a large complex covering much of Tintagel. This has astounded the team they didn't expect to find evidence of such a wealthy and sophisticated community from early Dark Age Britain. So do they really think they've discovered a Dark Age palace? And if so, what was it like to live in it? We can't be certain that it's a royal site, but whatever it was, it was a, it was a high status site because right. we got so much exotic material. Yeah, so, I mean, we saw some of this material coming out. So tell me about this piece of pottery. Yes, well, this, this is very, very finely made. It's probably it's part of a... It's very thin there. Yes, Gosh. it's probably... It's, it's a fine table dish 
a complete vessel would be quite large. Mm. So you've got this sort of large, expansive, quite shallow bowl, probably for communal feastings. And um, this is the handle of an amphora shirt, which would have contained wine coming from the Aegean, from Turkey, Marseille, around the coast of Spain. You know, and this is not actually from Tintagel, is it? <laughs> <laughs> this is a reconstruction of what one of these amphorae yes. from the Aegean, from Greece, might, yes. might have looked like. But this would be for carrying wine, probably, but could also be for olive oil, we don't know. But And the archaeology that you're looking at here, of course, dates to a, a really interesting time. We're looking at Britain after the collapse of the Roman Empire. We're looking at independent states. Yeah, I mean, Britain does break into lots of little states, like Mercia and Wessex and Kent and places, and Cornwall carries on in its own way. And this may well be a royal centre with connections far afield. See, I'm starting to go on flights of fancy now, and to me, these, this is the royal apartments of the, of the <laughs> palace at Tintagel. Yeah. This is where King Arthur lived. Well, it has got that extraordinary association from when Geoffrey of Monmouth writes about the, the history of the kings of Britain in the 12th century. He says that Arthur was conceived at Tintagel. Yeah. What, did he invent this? Had he pulled it out of various other legends? We really don't know. Although they may not have found evidence of King Arthur himself, the team have discovered that Dark Age Tintagel was a prosperous centre of trade and perhaps even a seat of royalty, a bastion against the turmoil that was engulfing Britain at this time. In the past, infant mortality rates were much, much higher than they are today. In the Dark Ages, it's thought that perhaps half of all children didn't make it to adulthood. And yet, when you look at cemeteries from the period, there just don't seem to be enough juvenile and infant burials. So were the burial rites for children different to those for adults? It is certainly possible. And archaeologists in South Wales have been making some intriguing discoveries. In the winter of 2014, record storms battered South Wales. They were so ferocious that they eroded the Pembrokeshire coastline. And human bones started to appear as the sand dunes were stripped back, revealing an ancient cemetery. These skeletons may contain precious clues about our past so for the last three years, a team from David Archaeology has been trying to save what they can from this now dangerously exposed site. This is classic rescue archaeology. Absolutely, you can see here that the threat is obvious and happening, and we're just dealing with it. It's day three of this year's dig, and they are beginning to excavate the Dark Age layers from the 7th to the 9th centuries AD. One burial emerges that is incredibly unusual and entirely different to anything they've seen so far. So it seems to be a, a woman buried with a baby in the crook of her arms. That's right. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. That's the baby's head, yes. Skull, uh, pelvis in this area. OK. Here's the mother's left arm. Finding an infant burial from this time is extremely rare. Tiny bones tend to decompose quickly in many cemeteries. But here, the infant bones are perfectly preserved by the coastal sand. Ken, do you want to tell me what you're drawing? It's a piss grave containing the uh, remains of a, what looks like an infant. An infant? Oh, it's a new, newborn, probably. Oh, yeah. in a perinatal, very mm -hmm. small child, you see the length of it. Yeah. And incredibly, other infant burials soon begin to emerge. It's rare to find this quantity of infants in a communal cemetery. Um, it doesn't matter what date it's from, they, they are rare to find. Um, here we've got a large number of them because the preservation in the sand has been so good for skeletal remains. By week three, they found an incredible 20 infant graves a sobering reminder of infant mortality rates at this time, and an intimate insight into how parents felt about losing so many young children at such an early age. 
1,400 years ago. So what we've got here is a really rather nice bone pin, possibly a shroud pin. And some of the burials that we've had here, you can see from the position of the skeleton, the feet particularly, that these people looked like they were wrapped in shrouds when they were buried. There, there was one absolutely tiny little infant. I actually excavated it myself. Its legs were actually crossed at the ankles, so again, it suggests it was wrapped before being placed in the ground. This pin would have been used to carefully secure the shroud around this dead child before it was placed in its grave. And out of the sand comes an intriguing series of finds. So this is one of a number of areas where we've had white quartz pebbles across the site, but they've been the, the graves of infants, so the pebbles have been really carefully placed. We had one with over 100 pebbles on the top of it, densely packed, and obviously a lot of care invested in the grave of the baby inside. So what did these quartz pebbles signify? Dig co-director Marion Shiner and osteologist Katie Hemmer have come into the lab to tell me about their discoveries and what they tell us about the attitude of Dark Age parents to the deaths of their children. We don't know the purpose of the quartz pebbles. They're found in mortuary contexts from the prehistoric period onward and they're found at other early medieval Welsh cemeteries. There's a passage in the Bible in Revelation which talks about the person who has found Christ being given a white stone mm. and in, in that a new name. There is evidence that in the later medieval period, each mourner at a funeral brought a stone or took a stone and put it on top of the grave. But, mm. the, you know, there must have been over 130 people at the funeral of that child, if that's what this is signifying. And, and they are only on the children's graves. And they're burying very, very tiny children, well, infants. Yes, it's the thing that really strikes you about the site is the level of care that a lot of these infants and young children were buried with. Absolutely, I think we have to move away from old notions that people didn't care for their mm. children mm. at this time. They are investing the same amount of effort, if not more, into the burials of the really youngest members um, of this population. Discoveries like this show how archaeology can change the story of Britain. From revealing lost religious practices of the Dark Ages and turning on its head our view about how prepared our soldiers were when sent to fight on the Western Front, to the unique discovery on Salisbury Plain that shows the ritual landscape of Stonehenge was bigger than we'd ever imagined. Our ancestors made the country we live in today. And through archaeology, we've been able to reach back through the centuries and touch their lives.